Good morning, Grace Life. I know folks are still coming in. That means pit crews were really good, I guess. Let's stand up together. Uh, we want to just begin our time. Um, we've been learning the last couple of weeks just about who we are in Jesus, and all of that is because of who God is, and that, that, that determines who we are because of who God is. And so that's what this song is talking about. This song is talking about how there's nobody like our God. He is holy. He is set apart. There's nobody that can do what he can do. So let's sing this song together. Holy Spirit. I did a cappella. <laughs> think about these words as we're singing them out.
place and the atmosphere. Your glory, God, is what our hearts long for, to be overcome by your presence. Lord, Holy Spirit, you are welcome. Come flood this place and fill the atmosphere. Your glory, God, is what our hearts long for, to be overcome by your presence. Lord God, that's our, our prayer today, that you would flood this place and you'd flood our lives with your presence and with your glory. Lord, we thank you that nothing can separate us from the love of God that is in Christ Jesus. Father, we're grateful that last week is over. thankful for new mercies today and for a new week and new possibilities because of the power of your presence that will never leave us and will never forsake us so thank you that we get to come together today as a family and to worship you and to have you recalibrate our hearts back around yourself. And we ask that you would do that today, that our hearts might be filled with joy and that heaven might be filled with glory to you alone. And we ask this in Jesus' good name. And all of God's people said, amen. 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 Well, be seated for just a moment while I give you some Grace Life <laughs> news. Welcome today. Glad you're here. I know we're still trying to find some seats, so if you'll kind of Squeeze in a little bit. There's three there. There's a couple on the front. There's a couple back there. There's about three or four right over here. Uh, Y'all uh, all went to pit crews, I guess, right? Did everybody do pit crews today? All right. Amen. If you didn't, um, we could take your seat now, and you could go to pit crew. Uh, <laughs> nobody was in the first hour, so we knew everybody was in pit crews in the first hour. So that's been fantastic. When you came in the doors today, somebody probably handed you a worship guide, and uh, on that worship guide, there's a tearaway tab. And if you're not part of our Grace Life family, but you have some questions about us or you'd like to attend the next Membership Matters class, you can use the tearaway tab on that worship guide to communicate with us. You can check the box that you want to come to the next membership class. Use that to let us know how we can pray for you, how we can serve you. We'd be happy to do that. Even with this many people in the room today, we're missing about 70 that are normally in here because our 6th through ninth graders are in Gatlinburg on their retreat with their leaders. So pray for them. They're having a wonderful time. And uh, you think it's cold here. It's pretty cold up there in Pigeon Forge this morning, too. Uh, so continue to pray for them. Uh, I am glad you're going to pit crews. And uh, we got one pit crew left. And so I hope that if you haven't been able to make one yet, you'll find your way into one next week. I know that you'll be blessed if you get to do that. Next weekend's a big weekend at Grace Life. Men, we got a men's conference here Friday night and Saturday. Uh, today's the day to sign up for that. Today's the deadline, all right? So inside your worship guide, you can see information about the men's conference. You can stop by the fireside room today. And to get signed up for that, you don't want to miss that. Also, Pastor Mike's leading the worship ministry in their retreat this weekend as well. So pray for them because that has a huge impact on us. God does great things through that retreat. And then that overflows onto me and to you as we worship him together throughout the year. And then also this Saturday, we have a missions project over at McAdory Middle School with Feed My Starving Children. You also have information inside your worship guide about that. So busy, busy weekend. Great weekend. Then we're going to cap it off by wrapping up This Is Us and Pit Cruise next Sunday. We're going to do that at the Lord's Table. It's going to be a very special Lord's Supper next Sunday because this family is really going to feel more like family when you come to the table next Sunday than you felt the last time that we came to the table. Do you believe that? Say amen. 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 I'm so glad you said that. Hey, well, let's stand up. We're going to continue to worship today. We're really crowded in here, so you probably can't move about the room, but look for somebody within arm's reach of you that you can just fist bump, give a smile to, ask them their name if you don't know it, and let's worship the Lord together.
I was buried beneath my shame Who could carry that kind of weight? It was my tomb Till I met you I was breathing but not alive All my failures I tried to hide It was my tune Till I met you Call my name You called my name the darkness out of the darkness into your glorious day you called my name and I ran out of that grave out of the darkness into your glorious day it says now your mercy has saved my soul your freedom is all that I know. Now your mercy has saved my soul. Now your freedom is all that I know. The old man knew Jesus when I met you. You come. into your glorious day you called my name and I ran out of that grave out of the darkness into your glorious day this is about us I needed rescue my sin was heavy here we go let's sing it I needed rescue, my sin was heavy, but chains break at the weight of your glory. I needed shelter, I was an orphan, now you call me a citizen of heaven. When I was broken, you were my healing, now you're When you call my name, I ran out of that train, out of the darkness, into your glorious day. You called my name, and I ran out of that train. Yes, I did. Sing it again, you call my name, you call my name, and I ran out of that grave, out of the darkness, into your glorious day. You call my name, and I ran out of that grave. Amen. Amen. God, we applaud you. God, we worship you. We thank you, Lord, because you have given us a new name. God, you don't call us sinners anymore. Because of Jesus, if we put our trust in you, Jesus, because of what you did on the cross, God, you see us as righteous. You see us as holy, not because of anything that we can do. There's nothing we can do to make ourselves right with you. We were lost, but you came down and you saved us. And because of that now, God, we are citizens of heaven. And we thank you and we praise you with songs of thanksgiving. God, we don't sing out of, out of condemnation. 
Lord, your word says that who the Son sets free is free indeed. And so we sing to you today as free sons and daughters of the King. Lord, help us to put our trust in you. Lord, it doesn't, the things in our life, our inheritance, Lord, uh, it doesn't rise or fall with, with what we do. It doesn't rise or fall with our health. It doesn't rise or fall with our job. It rises and falls only in you, Jesus, and you have risen from the grave. And so we trust in you. We praise you. It's in your name we come and we worship. Amen. Let's sing this song, My Inheritance. It says, what is silver and gold? What is anything I could hold compared to you? Let's sing. What is silver and gold? Or anything I could hold compared to you? Compared to you. What is fame and success? Just fade emptiness compared to you, compared to you. All that you hold in store is all that I want, oh Lord. I will shout, I will sing. Jesus, you're my everything, you're my treasure, my inheritance. I am rich, I am blessed in your love and faithfulness, you're my treasure.
guys have a seat, and uh, we want to just share in this baptism together. This is our friend, Mr. Lewis Gibson, and uh, the Lord brought Lewis through our doors. It's been a number of months ago now. Easter Sunday. Easter Sunday. Fantastic. And uh, on that day, we even began to pray together that day, and God's been working in Lewis's life, and uh, Lewis has professed that he has a personal relationship with Jesus, uh, but he's never followed the Lord in believer's baptism. Is that right? Well, not since I was 13. Not since he was 13. And things are kind of starting over <laughs> yeah. for Lewis. Uh, and we're excited about that. God is working in Lewis's life, and, uh, and he is uh, honest as the day is long that he's got a ways to go. And I told him, Lewis, I don't know anybody that doesn't have a ways to go, so you're in good company right here, brother. So, Brother Lewis, upon your profession of faith in Jesus... As your Savior and your Lord, I baptize you, my brother, in the name of the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit. Buried with Christ in his death and raised to walk in new life. Amen. Amen. All right, boys and girls, come on and hang out with me. Ushers, if you guys would come to receive the offering today as well. Man, if I love old Lewis. You'll love him too when you get to know him. First Sunday he was here, Easter Sunday, he said, Hey, I'm, I'm an alcoholic. I gotta, I gotta, God's gotta change my life. And, He's been faithful ever since that, man. He was here in the first service and probably in a pit crew right now. And we're getting to see God change lives all the time, all the time. And we're thankful for that. Thankful for all these boys and girls up here, too. Miss, did y'all do pit crew in the first hour? How was that? Was that good? Like, all of y'all were together, right? Miss Hannah and Mr. Corey had a team of people uh, that did big pit crew for the children. So the people who normally teach them in Sunday school... This week, they got to go to a pit crew, so that was good thinking, and I'm glad you guys had a good time. So Ms. Hannah said, Pastor Joel, could you do a gospel connection today with the boys and girls? And you know what the, the greatest gospel connection is? The Bible. The whole Bible. And you guys last year learned how to make a gospel connection to the whole Bible because you learned what the whole Bible's about. Do you still remember that? Huh? Do you still remember that? Let's see. You ready? Are you guys ready for this? And I didn't practice, all right, so I might mess it up. Y'all have to help me out. Maybe the adults can help us out in here a little bit, too. Last year, this is what we did most every Sunday with our boys and girls, just teaching them the whole Bible. But it wasn't just the boys and girls that learned that, what is it? A lot of us learned the whole Bible last year, too, right? So let's see how, if we remember it. And if you weren't here last year, um, this would be a good time to turn your phone on and record this. Or we'll be online. The service will be up online later this afternoon. You guys ready? 6,000 years ago, God created how many people? Two, what were their names? Adam and Eve. Do they obey God or disobey? They disobeyed. What's the Bible call it when we disobey? Sin. And yet God stepped into the garden. He made them a promise. He promised to send a Savior. That's right. But sin just got worse. And so God sent a flood and he destroyed the whole world except for one man by the name of Noah and his family. And after Noah and his family came off the ark and the world began to repopulate, the people built the tower of Babel, but God confused their languages, and that was the beginning of the nations of the earth. Isn't that impressive so far? Huh? They're doing pretty good, right? That's the beginning of the nations of the earth. And out of all those people, God chose one man to form a new nation. What's his name? Abraham. And God promised Abraham three things, lots of children, lots of land, and a blessing from him to the nations of the earth. And sure enough, Abraham had a son by the name of Isaac, and Isaac had a son by the name of Jacob, and Jacob had a son by the name of Joseph, and Joseph ended up living in Egypt, and the Pharaoh put all of God's people into slavery, and God raised up a man to bring them out of slavery. His name is Moses, but Moses did not take them into the promised land. Instead, his protege, Joshua, took them into the promised land, but even when they got into the promised land, their hearts were still wicked, and so they went through a series or a cycle of Judges, but then the people cried out to God, We don't want any more judges, God. We want a king. So they got King Saul, they got King David, and they got King Solomon. And then the kingdom, it split. And who took the northern kingdom? Close. Phone a friend. Assyrians <laughs> totally destroyed the northern kingdom. All right? We're getting an A minus on our pet. Or maybe an A. All right? The Assyrians conquered the northern. Who came and got the southern? Babylonians. They took them into captivity for how long? Do you remember? Seventy years. And after those 70 years, God returned his people back to their homes, back to Jerusalem. They rebuild the city. They rebuild the temple. And then for 400 some odd years, God got really, really quiet. 
until he spoke to a little girl, young, young girl, by the name of Mary. And he said, Mary, there's a baby in your tummy. By the way, today's Sanctity of Life Sunday. God's always recognized that as a baby. There's a baby in your tummy, Mary, and you're going to name him Jesus. And Jesus went on to live a what kind of life? A perfect and sinless life. He died on the cross. He rose from the dead. He ascended into, and once in heaven, he sent down his Holy Spirit. And that was the beginning of the, the church. That's us. That's where you and I come into that story. And here we are sharing Jesus with the whole world. But one day, Jesus is coming back. And he's going to take us to live with him. And then he's going to make a new a new world, a new heaven and a new earth where we're going to live with him forever. <laughs> Just a little bridge to last week's message if you weren't here. Hey, how about the boys and girls? Good job, y'all. The Bible is the greatest gospel connection because every single word of the Bible is pointing us to Jesus, God's Son, our Savior, the only way for us to be right with God, all right? So that's the best gospel connection of them all. You keep looking for gospel connections in your life. Brother Tom Crepine is going to come. If you brought an offering today and you want to give it to Mr. Tom, he'll receive that today, and we're so grateful for that. Did y'all hear it's going to snow tomorrow? Half a foot, no school tomorrow. <laughs> y'all just go ahead and stay up late tonight, sleep in tomorrow. You don't have school tomorrow? Well, that worked out well. <laughs> I'm just kidding. I don't think it's, it's going to snow probably, but not here. <laughs> Maybe where the 6th, 7th, 8th, and ninth graders are. Maybe there. Always say, Brother Tom, pray for us. Let's pray, please. Dear Heavenly Father, we thank you for this beautiful day you've given us. Thank you for these children who come to learn more about you and pass it on to us. Let us influence them. Let them influence us, Father. Bless these tithes and offerings and use them to glory you, by you. And it's in Jesus' precious name we pray. Amen. 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 See you, boys and girls. <coughs> This Sanctity of Life Sunday, and churches are reflecting on that today all around the country, and we wanted to pause for a moment and do the same. Our annual March for Life is coming up in just a couple of weeks. I'd encourage you to be a part of that. Great mission opportunity for you to be involved, and we are a family of servant missionaries, after all, so I want to encourage you to uh, seek out a way to be a part of that. You can call the church for, for more information or out in the fireside room. I think we've got some information set up outside there as well. I live in Tuscaloosa County, you know that probably by now, where the death rate of babies is greater than the birth rate of babies. Tuscaloosa is home to one of the largest abortion providers in the southeastern United States. In fact, 
the doctor that delivered me into the world in 1974 is still um, in practice, but he's no longer delivering babies. He's aborting babies. Um, he's aborting more babies than almost any other uh, doctor in the country. Um, so I was born two years after Roe v. Wade. And um, just so you know, Roe v. Wade is based on the premise that they saw in 1972 a fetus in a mother's womb has the potential for life. Well, modern medicine has come a long way since 1972, and we now know that is far more than simply potential for life in that womb. We have a heartbeat, and we have brain activity, and we have very unique uh, DNA like none other in the entire world. So uh, we need laws that match what we now know to be true in our world. But we also want to have compassion on people who find themselves in a situation where they think there are no other choices and there are no other options. And so just let me say to you today, if you or somebody you know feel like abortion is your only option. I want to tell you it is not. There is a church family here that will, I'm, I don't have permission to say this because we have no ministry in place to do this, but we will, by God's grace, it'll happen. I'm just telling you, if you need somebody to take care of your doctor's visits and to pay for all that and to help you get that child as safely as possible into the world and then you even want somebody to raise that child or adopt that child or help you raise that child i got 1100 brothers and sisters in the lord jesus christ right here that stand ready to do that all right and not judging not condemning none of that because jesus came in love to us and so if you find yourself or you know somebody today it finds themselves in a difficult place in life. Uh, Grace Life, the door's open. And this is a place you can, you can run to, all right? And I appreciated your applause and your affirmation of all that. So let's get back to what we're preaching here this month, a series that we're calling This Is Us. We know that a lot of us have gotten ourselves into a rut in life. We've gotten ourselves into a rut in terms of our relationship with God. We've kind of gotten ourselves into a rut when it comes to church and our brothers and sisters in Christ as well. And so we're at Grace Life this month trying to just mix some things up and change the pattern of our experiences here a little bit, trying to cross paths while we're here with people that maybe we've never met, people that we don't know. We're doing this through pit crews. We're also taking this as an opportunity to reflect on us as a church family and say, really, who, who are we? Answer some foundational questions about Grace Life. Who are we and what is it that we're supposed to be doing and how are we supposed to be going about that and why are we going about doing that and how long are we going to be doing that? And so we started this journey a couple of weeks ago by addressing what's probably one of the most important questions, which is a question of identity. Who are we? That's the question. And typically what we do at the individual level and we also do this at the church level, is we start to define our identity, unfortunately, by what we do. So we'll say, well, I'm a teacher, or I'm a welder, or I'm a nurse, or I'm a, I'm a whatever, I'm a pastor. And so that because that's what I do, then that's who I am. The problem with that is what we do is going to change. Circumstances in life are going to change. Seasons of life are going to change. You're not always going to be a coach. You're not always going to be a nurse. I'm not always going to be a pastor. So I don't want my identity, my worth, my value to be rooted in something that's temporary, to be rooted in something that's circumstantial. And we do that at the church level too. Unfortunately, a lot of churches today are finding their identity based on what they do. Well, our church does this, and we have this program, and we're good at this. We're a, you know, this kind of church. You know, you got to fill in the blank. They're taking what they do, and, and we've done the same thing here, all right? We take what we do, our programs, and we say, that's who we are. The problem with that, once again, is that's very temporal, and it's very circumstantial. What we do today as a church may not be the exact same thing that we're doing tomorrow. Now, not, I'm not talking about things according to God's Word, all right? I'm talking about programs, certain ministries, activities. I'm talking about secondary and on down the list sort of stuff. We always want to follow the Word of God. That's not up for discussion. That's never, ever up for debate. So instead of moving in this direction to determine who we are personally and collectively at a church, we want to go back this direction, and we want to start with the question, 
Well, who is God? We want to find something or someone that is unchangeable in this world to anchor our identity in, right? To anchor our value and our worth and the purpose for our life. We want that to be anchored in someone or something that is unchangeable. And the only unchangeable thing in the universe is the one who exists outside the universe, who created the universe. God, very God, one God existing in three persons. The Bible tells us that he is Father, and He is Son, and He is Holy Spirit. And that's where we begin to find our identity in who God is. Father, Son, Holy Spirit. Now we can ask the question, well, what is it that God does? Well, we know that God as Father, He adopts sons and daughters for Himself into His family out of slavery and sin and self. He brings us into a relationship with Himself, not by good things that we do, but by what Jesus did at the cross for us. Our hope is in Christ alone. Nothing but the blood of Jesus can make us right with God. Nothing but the blood of Jesus can reconcile us to God. That's who God is. He is a father who adopts sons and daughters of God. The son, who is the son? He is Jesus. And Jesus said, I've come into the world, even though I'm the son of man, even though I'm the king of the universe, in other words, I have not come into the world to be served. Think about that. The one who created all things said, I didn't show up on planet earth for you to serve me. But I came to serve you. He's a servant. So this is who our God is. He is Father who adopts, and He is Son who serves, and He is Holy Spirit. Jesus told His disciples in Acts chapter 1, He said, You stay here in Jerusalem until you're clothed with power from on high. Then I'm going to send the Holy Spirit. He's going, to be, he's going to give you that power, and you will be sent out then as my witnesses, as missionaries, all, all across the world to every tongue and tribe and nation. So this is who God is. He is Father, Son, Holy Spirit, and He adopts and He serves and He sends us out as missionaries. Now we can ascertain what our identity is. It is not rooted in us. It is rooted in our unchanging God. And because God is Father who adopts, that makes us family. Because God is Son who serves, that makes us servants. Because God is Holy Spirit who sends out into the world, that makes us missionaries. So we, we define that. We defined our identity a couple of weeks ago. Who are we? We are a family of servant missionaries. This church should never have an identity crisis. We should never be trying to figure out, well, exactly who is Grace Life, all right? I mean, there's guys that get paid to go around to churches as church consultants, and they're going to say, we're going to figure out what y'all do really well, and that's who you are. If that guy ever shows up here, you can kindly ask him to go somewhere else, okay? We know who we are, and it's not rooted in us, and it's not rooted in what we do. Who we are is rooted in who our unchanging God is, and what he does, what he has done, and what he is continuing to do. That's who we are. We're a family of servant missionaries. So last week we said, now, knowing who we are, what is it that we're supposed to do? Now we got the horse back in front of the cart, right? So what is it we're supposed to do? Well, four things, but they really all flow out of the first thing, and it all starts with worship. Worship is the right response to who God is and what He does. The right response, when we recognize and remember who God is and what He does, the right response is to give Him worship, to give Him honor, to give Him praise. Not simply with just our lips, but with our lives. 24-7, no matter what you find yourself doing. I had a guy after the first service. He came up busking me about how to worship God. He's drinking his cup of coffee as we're standing right here. I said, when you drink that cup of coffee with a mind that is focused on God and a heart that is affectionate toward God, you're worshiping God by drinking a cup of coffee. I didn't make that up. Paul said that through the writing of the Holy Spirit. He said, whatever you do, whether you eat or drink, whatever you do, whether you're playing baseball or knitting a quilt or quilting a quilt. I don't know what you do with a quilt. <laughs> I lost me at baseball. <laughs> Whatever you do, Paul says, do it all for the glory of God, right? So that's worship. And then out of worship now, we, because God is Father who adopts and we're family, from a heart of worship, we want to be well connected to our family. That means we want to be intentional, intentional, intentional to know our brothers and sisters in the Lord. We, don't be, we want to be intentional to build the kind of relationships with brothers and sisters in Christ that we can care for each other, pray for each other, 
help each other, all right? So that's out of a heart of worship we want to connect. And because Jesus is the Son who serves and we're servants, then out of a heart of worship we, like Jesus, want to serve Him. And we want to serve His church. He laid down His life for the church. And He has called upon you and I to do the very same thing, to serve His church. You say, but just to serve the church? What about outside the church? Well, that's where we get here. The Holy Spirit has sent us out as missionaries. Now, out of a heart of worship, we now want to go into the world and show them the love of God and share with them the love of God to make disciples of all nations. That's what it is that we're supposed to do. And that's what I want to talk about today. Worship, connect, serve, and go, and, and what it is that we're doing. But really, I want to answer this question. How do we do that? We know who God is. We know what God does. We know who we are. We know the four things that we're supposed to be doing, but how do we do those things? And I want to answer that question in two ways today. First, real quickly, I want to answer that at the micro level. I want to answer that in a way that's really tangible, but then I really want to camp out a little bit longer on answering that question at the macro level in a way that's a little more intangible. And here's what I mean by that. When we talk about worship, connect, serve, go here at Grace Life, that's what we expect of you as a member of Grace Life. Now, if you're not a member of Grace Life, we're so glad you're here. Our door is always open to you. We love you. We want you to come here. We want to serve you. We don't have any expectations of you whatsoever. Just, you're our guest. But once you cross the threshold and say, look, I want to join this family, well, guess what? Now we've got expectations. And we expect you to worship. We expect you to connect. And we expect you to serve. And we expect you to go because that's who we are. And if you're going to be part of us, that's who you are. Together, we're a family of servant missionaries. And so at a real uh, micro sort of level, the way worship happens, the way we expect worship to happen in your life, is that ought to be going on in your personal life every single day. We touched on that last week, right? That the first part of every day, you ought to be with God. The first part of every week, which is Sunday, you ought to be with God, time with God. The first part of all the resources that God entrusts you with, the first part of that needs to go to God. God is holy. He's not a leftover kind of God. We honor Him by keeping Him first. So the first part of my day, the first part of my week, the first part of my resources, that's who He is. So what that means is, is in your daily life, you ought to be worshiping the Lord all the time. But when we come together here on Sundays. That's our expectation, that as much as possible, you're going to be here worshiping God with your church family. Now, I know this is old school. Uh, unfortunately, our culture in America today, uh, it's hard to find a lot of churches that are keeping standards and high expectations of the people who are in their family. And maybe it's because they don't look at themselves as a family. But that's how the Bible looks at us. That's how we look at each other. And with my family over there in Tuscaloosa, we've got expectations for our family. And we've got expectations for this church family. And so we just expect, as often as possible, you're going to be here in worship with your church family. It's not going to be possible. Possible every week. So we, we've got a list of people that are never here physically to worship with us because physically they cannot be here. Their health will not allow them to be here. Their heart's here, their mind's here, and that honors God. We've got another list of people who work most every Sunday. They're rarely able to be here, but their heart's here, their mind's here, and that's honoring and pleasing to the Lord. But when we can be here, we want to make it our habit, and we want to make it our practice to be here. It blows my mind when I hear parents say, well, I let my kids choose. Really? Well, yeah, you know, they just don't really like this class at church. They don't really like this teacher. Is that how you function with their education? Well, they don't really like their algebra teacher, so we're just going to skip it. <laughs> we, we ain't really digging 11th grade, so we're just going to skip it. Come on, Mom and Dad. Don't let me hear you say that. That kid is under your roof, all right? And you need to have expectations. You need, as a parent, to share the same expectations for them as we as a church family have for each other, all right? So that's what worship looks like here. Now, we got a lot of high school kids. They're not going to be members here much longer. They're, gonna, they're soon going to be grown. They've not developed the right habits under their mom and dad's leadership, and they're going to fall off the edge here before too long. It's going to break my heart, and it's going to grieve me. But that's why we've made this stuff 
optional, man. Jesus laid down his life for us to be his church and to get together and to come here and to worship. So whoever's got the baby crying right now, just pay attention to what I'm telling you, all right? Because they're going to keep crying and about 15 or 16, they're going to say, oh, man, I don't want to go to church. You go, no, you can go to church. You can keep crying like you did in church. You can just take your crying to the house of the Lord, all right? You can cry over there. So that's our expectation. You're going to worship. We also expect that you're going to connect. Because we are a family. This is who we are. And so we see connecting happen in Sunday school. We see it happening in small groups. We see it happening in D groups. And you've got to put forth that effort to make it happen. You don't connect in this big room. All right? This is where we get to lift one ginormous collective voice and praise to God and hear his big booming voice from his word come down on us all at once. But connecting happens in circles, not in rows. It happens in smaller groups, and some of y'all are really digging that in pit crew, and I'm really glad that you are. We expect our people not only to worship and to connect, but also to serve. That's who we are. We don't expect that because we're like, you know, this is trendy. No, this is the Word of God. This is who Jesus is. So we worship, we connect, and we serve. And, and a lot of serving in your life goes on informally, just throughout your life. I understand that. But also, you have things that you do specifically here for the body of Christ at Grace Life. And this is a serving church, and I'm, I'm so eternally grateful for that. I can just look around the room, and I can pretty well tell you where most everybody in this room is serving, how they're involved, how they're ministering, how they're building up their church family for God's glory by what they're doing. Now, if you don't have a ministry yet, if you're not in an area of service just yet, that's okay. We're here to help you do that, okay? Maybe life circumstances have changed for you. Good thing your identity wasn't rooted in your serving, right? Uh, it's, in, it's rooted in who God is. And so we're, our pastors are here, here to help you figure out where your niche is at Grace Life. The way we'll do that is we'll sit down and we'll say, what is it you hate to do? <laughs> then that's what you're going to do. No, I'm kidding. Totally kidding. We want to find out what do you love to do, man? What cranks your tractor? What would you get up and volunteer to do without pay every day if you could? And then we're going to say, that's probably what God wants you to be doing. Because we have found this as Christ's followers. What brings him glory brings us joy. And so whatever it is that's bringing you joy, that's probably the way God has intended you, at least for right now, to bring him glory. So we want to help you figure that out. And we've had people come to us and go, hey, what about this? Well, we don't do that, but maybe God brought you here so we can do that. So then a ministry starts because God brought the right person here. So that's our, this is us, all right? This is us. We're a family of servant missionaries. And our expectation as such is that we're going to worship and we're going to connect and we're going to serve. And then we expect our people to go to be thinking like missionaries, all right? That happens in three ways. It happens through praying, right? We ought to be praying for the person across the aisle like a missionary. Lord, I don't know this person in church today, and I don't know if they know you. If they don't, I pray they'd be saved today. We need to be praying for the person that lives across the street like missionaries. I don't know if they know Jesus, but I want them to know Jesus, and I'm praying they'll come to know Jesus if they don't know Jesus. We need to be praying for people that live on the other side of our country like that. Lord, I don't know if they know Jesus, but I'm praying that they'll know Jesus. We need to be praying who live on the other side of the world. Is that me? All right, we'll, we'll work it out. Well, we got to be praying like missionaries. Does that make sense? The second way that we go is through our giving. And I told you guys last year, you gave $245,000 to missions. That's huge. That we just... Out, it just left here. It left us. And it went out in all kinds of ways to bring people to Jesus. That's great. So your giving does that. And the third way we do missions, praying, giving, and then going. Actually going across the aisle, going across the room, going across the street, going across the country, or going across the world and showing somebody the love of Jesus. Sharing the love of Jesus with somebody. So that's how we do Worship, connect, serve, and go at Grace Life on the micro level. That's the nuts and bolts. But what I want to talk about with the time that we got left today is not so much about how we do these things in general at Grace Life, but what I really want to talk about today is how we do these things in a world where doing these things is not easy. How do you... Remain faithful to worship and to connect and to serve and to go when there's enormous pressure outside of you in this world that's pushing against all of that. 
How do you continue to worship and connect and serve and go when there's tremendous temptation on the inside of you to withdraw from that and not to do those things? How do we as a family of servant missionaries continue to worship and connect and serve and go when we can find thousands of excuses every single day not to do that? How will we live lives that are marked by a devotion to worship God with all our heart, soul, mind, and strength, connect to His family with all our heart, soul, mind, and strength, serve His church with all our heart, soul, mind, and strength, and go into the world for the gospel, with the gospel, with all our heart, soul, mind, and strength? How will our lives remain characterized by living like that when everything is pressing in on us and we don't want to do those things anymore? All right? Look, last Sunday, I did not want to be here. Didn't want to worship, didn't want to connect, didn't want to serve, didn't want to go. I'm just being honest with you. Go, man, the preacher faked it last Sunday. Well, you can call it what you want to call it. I have obligations. I have a duty before God, certain things he's, he expects of me. Listen, none of us can afford to live life out of our emotions, right? There's some days you don't feel like being married. You best be married that day, Right? <laughs> There's days you don't feel like obeying your mom and daddy. You best obey your mom and daddy that day. We can't let our feelings drive our life. But there are days that your pastor, look, crap happens to your pastor just like it happens to all of you. And there's some times you just don't want to do those things. Sometimes you want to do those things, but you feel like you can't do those things. I had a conversation with some of our church this morning like that. Really wanted to worship, really wanted to connect, really wanted to serve, really wanted to go. But their heart is so broken, their heart is so heavy, they're low, they've been carrying so long, the loneliness is so great, they're zapped mentally, physically, emotionally, and spiritually. And they said, even though I want to do those things, I don't think I got it in me to do those things. Any of you ever get to that point in your life? That person's here, by the way. But that's what we want to talk about today. How do we keep on doing what it is that we're supposed to do when we don't want to? Or when all the odds are stacked against us and we don't think that we can? I can only tell you one thing today, and I'm going to tell it to you over and over and over again. It's another question we got to answer. Who God is, what He does, who we are, what we do. How do we do it? Trust and treasure God supremely. You've heard that around here before. But we're connecting all the dots today. You've got to trust God more than the feelings you have. You've got to trust God more than even conventional wisdom. The Bible says, trust in Him with all your heart and don't lean on your own understanding. In all your ways to acknowledge Him and He will direct your path we got to trust Him supremely. And we got to treasure Him supremely. What that means is nothing's before Him in our life. We treasure Him more than we do anything else. We treasure Him more than we treasure things of life. We treasure Him even more than life itself. That we treasure Him supremely. We treasure Him more than our comfort. Here's a true story. When I said that line in the first service, Tony Thompson jumped up. Well, he didn't jump up. But he got up out of his seat and he went and stood back there where Scott LaFond is right now. And he was standing back there against the wall. And, I, and, I, and, I, and God just reminded me, because I said, you got you to treasure God more than you do, do your own comfort. And there stood Tony, left his seat, standing in the back. If you don't know Tony, you don't know why he was standing in the back. When Tony was a younger man and his children were younger, he bought a camper, pulled behind, going on vacation, had some trouble. Pulled off the side of the road. Tony gets out to try to work on it. Drunk driver veers off the road on the interstate. Careens into the camper and into Tony. And Tony nearly died. Tony suffered with tremendous health issues, back issues primarily, ever since then. And he comes to church and he's horribly uncomfortable. He cannot sit in these chairs for very long. And when he can't stand it anymore, he'll stand up and he'll stand in the back. But he treasures God more than he does his own comfort. 
If we're going to continue to do these things, that's what it requires, that we trust and we treasure God supremely. And I want to break each one of those down. How are we going to keep on being a people whose lives are marked by worshiping God, even when times are tough? Even when it's easy to be distracted. Even when it's easy to think of what's below instead of what's above. Even when we feel like we got nothing left in us that would bring us back with any kind of energy to the throne of God. How are we going to keep on worshiping in times like that? What do you do when you're tempted to cave in? Here's the answer. Trust and treasure God supremely. You can find a thousand reasons. To stop worshiping God with all your heart and soul and mind and strength. How do you not cave into it? You got to keep on trusting. And you got to keep on treasuring. I'm not telling you that's easy. I feel like I owe a lot of people an apology if you ever heard somebody say, Ask Jesus in your heart and your life will be wonderful. <laughs> no, Jesus said in this world, you're going to have trouble. This world's broken, it's messed up. Now, he's going to put it all back together, I assure you, but until then, it's just going to be hard. I don't have easy answers for you today. I don't have, like, some advice. Here's three tips. Do these things. Try this. This will help you see life a little more rosy-like. I don't have that. All I can tell you is you got to battle for your soul. you got to fight through your emotions. you got to fight through the exhaustion. you got to fight through the fatigue. you got to fight through the lies of the enemy. And you got to press on in the armor of God and keep trusting Him supremely. There's no other way but to trust and obey. And you got to press on and just keep treasuring Him. him. And fighting off the pressure outside and inside. You remember, uh, I told you about the, the bucks I'm chasing at my house right now. Shadrach, half rack, and a ways to go. <laughs> That's a true story. But, but it probably reminded you out of Daniel chapter 3 when I said that. There were three Hebrew boys once upon a time. The kids told you that God's people were taken into captivity by the Babylonians. Three of those were Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego. And, and Nebuchadnezzar, the king of the Babylonians has a statue built that looks like him, and he issues a decree that when the band plays, everybody's got to hit their knees and worship him. Band plays, everybody hits their knees and worships Nebuchadnezzar, except Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego. And Nebuchadnezzar's not having it. In Daniel chapter 3, verse 15, he says, I'll give you one more chance to bow down and worship the statue I've made when you hear the sound of the musical instruments. But if you refuse, you will be thrown immediately into the blazing furnace. And then, what God, and then what God will be able to rescue you from my power? Verse 16, guys. Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego replied, O Nebuchadnezzar, we do not need to defend ourselves before you. Verse 17, if we're thrown into the blazing furnace, the God whom we serve is able to save us. He will rescue us from your power, your majesty. But even if he doesn't, we want to make it clear to you, your majesty, that we will never serve your gods or worship the gold statue you have set up. That's trusting and treasuring God supremely. Even in light of a blazing furnace. I would simply ask you and me today, what have we been bowing down to recently? What have we been giving honor to Recently in our lives, what have we put before God if we're not treasuring Him supremely? I get, I get really uh, encouraged when, when every Sunday I see single moms with their children in tow. Hundreds of excuses, hundreds of reasons. They could have just kept life easier. They're exhausted. They've been busting their tails all week trying to provide for their children, trying to be at all the children's activities. And this could be their fun day, their nap-in day, their chill-out day. And we would all go, we understand that. But you know what sets my heart on fire is to see those ladies bringing their sons and their daughters. They're, those are my heroes. I'm not your hero. At my house, I got the easy job on Sunday. My wife, she's had the hard job for 20 years. She's a single mom every single Sunday. I get here, they're, they're still asleep. It's peaceful and quiet when I leave. It tanks after that, man. And she's there to handle it. And you ladies who are doing that, you're the best. You're what makes the place go around here and at your house, too. And I'm grateful for that. i tell you what else also fires me up on Sunday. I, I keep my blinds cracked a little bit in my office on Sunday as I'm sitting there putting finishing touches on all this. 
And I see the wheelchairs come rolling. And I see the, the walkers come walking. I see the canes out. And like clockwork, here they come. It don't matter that it's 32 and feels like 18. It don't matter that they spent three days in a row at the doctor last week and got no energy left. But they're here. Because they trust and they treasure God supremely. I love that. When I look out and I see people still in their scrubs, you hadn't even been home from work last night. And you said, before I go home and go to sleep, I'm going to worship God with my church family. You have no idea how that encourages me and how that blesses me. It keeps me going. So how do we worship God when everything's pushing against it, trust and treasure God supremely? How do you connect with God's people when you don't want to do that anymore, when it seems like connecting to God's people might be too risky, what do you do? You trust and treasure God supremely. There's no Dale Carnegie course here about how to win friends and influence people. It's just hard, and it is risky, but we trust God and we treasure God. Just ask this guy in the Bible by the name of Ananias over in the book of Acts. There was this guy named Saul who was going around gathering up Christ followers. He's putting them in prison or having them killed. He supposedly gets saved and wants to go to church. Smells fishy, right? God speaks to a guy by the name of Ananias. Let me read that to you. Acts chapter 9, verse 10. Now there was a believer in Damascus named Ananias. The Lord spoke to him in a vision calling, Ananias. Yes, Lord, he replied. The Lord said, go over to Straight Street. Got it, Lord. Go to the house of Judas. Got it, Lord. When you get there, ask for a man from Tarsus. Got it, Lord. Name Saul. Uh-uh. <laughs> God said, he's praying to me right now. I've shown him a vision of a man named Ananias coming in, laying hands on him so he can see again. But Lord. You ever said that to the Lord? <laughs> but Lord, exclaimed Ananias, I've heard many people talk about the terrible things this man has done to believers in Jerusalem. Well, that's what we're coming to the Lord. But Lord, this is why I'm not going to church, Lord. But Lord, this is why I'm not going to talk to that person, Lord. But Lord, this is why I'm not going to pit crew. But Lord, this is what I've heard. He said, he's authorized by the leading priest to arrest everyone who calls upon your name. But the Lord said, go, for Saul is my chosen instrument to take my message to the Gentiles and to kings, as well as to the people of Israel, and I will show him how much he must suffer for my name's sake. So Ananias went and he found Saul. This is not what he wanted to do, but he trusted God supremely. He treasured God supremely, and he took that long walk to that house. And he walks in, and he says, Brother Saul, the Lord Jesus who appeared to you on the road, has sent me so that you might regain your sight and be filled with the Holy Spirit. And instantly something like scales, scales fell from Saul's eyes and he regained his sight and he got up and was baptized. Was Saul an easy guy to connect to? Uh-uh. Was Saul a risk? Yes. Could that be costly to Ananias and the people that Ananias loves? You better believe it could have been costly. But you know what? If Ananias, just a dude in the pew, hadn't have made a connection to somebody else, you and I might not be here today. Because those scales fell off of Saul's eyes, he begins to take the gospel to the Gentiles, of which I am one. That's the power of trusting and treasuring God when it comes to connecting with other people. Is it easy? No, it's not easy. we got 1,100 family members at Grace Life. You know how many of them are normal? <laughs> no, not one. No, not one. Not a one is normal in this place. Everybody's crazy. Everybody. Now, y'all know I am. Y'all get to hear me talk to y'all uninterrupted for an hour every week. It, I'm less crazy, I guess, because it takes you an hour every week to remind yourself he's crazy. You speak to me in the hall, and I'm reminded you're crazy, right? I mean, we're all just crazy. We're all a mess. It's not easy to connect with people all the time, all right? There's going to be some folks that just rub you wrong. Do you stop connecting with them? No, they're adopted by grace through faith into God's family just like you are. And you annoy somebody else just as much as they annoy you, right? 
You don't stop connecting because it's hard or it's risky or it's challenging or you're tired. If you've been in pit crew the last two weeks, you know we're weird. Some of you came out of pit crew the first week and said, yeah, I get the idea, but I sure hope I got a whole different group of people next week. That's okay. We all have our preferences, but we never want to stop putting forth the effort to connect with people in the family of God that he has bought with his shed blood. And some days, you just got to suck it up like Ananias and say, God, I kind of think you're kidding about this, but in case you're not, I'm going to trust you supremely, I'm going to treasure you supremely, and I'm going to go for it. And God will bless that every time. Think about the two soldiers who had gone through basic together and battlefield strewn with bodies and they're separated. The one asked his sergeant if he could run and find his friend. He said, no way. He defied orders. He jumps out. He runs across the field. He finds his friend. Bullets flying everywhere. He dives down on the ground. His friend's bleeding out. He looks up at his buddy and he says, I knew you'd come. That's the kind of way that we got to approach life with each other here. That kind of commitment. To each other, that kind of tenacity to be connected to each other. That ought to be our reputation here. Not that we're just connected to our besties. I don't like the word besties in a church family. But that we're just connected to our tribe. Hey, ladies, I don't like the word tribe in a church family. We're a family, that's who we are. I love that. I told you when EJ and Kim, new members of our church, and Donnie was nearly dead with a stroke, and they don't even know Donnie. I've told you this before. And I'm in the waiting room, and here comes EJ carrying as many McAllister's bags as he can. Because he, even though he didn't know the Fosters, he knew that's my family. I don't remember who this was, but not long ago, a member of our church died. I was at the funeral home, and I heard somebody asking one of our other church members. They said, I didn't know you know so-and-so. And they said, well, I really didn't, but we go to church together. I just thought, yes, we're family. That's what we are. Our church covenant says we weep with those who weep, and we rejoice with those who rejoice. How do you worship when it's hard? How do you connect when it's hard? You keep trusting and treasuring God supremely. How do you keep serving God and His people, His church, when it's hard? You trust and treasure God supremely. you got a thousand good reasons not to do it. I don't like it anymore. I don't like this person I'm on the team with anymore. My feelings got hurt. Somebody said something to me. I got stuff going on in my life, and it's just bad and heavy, and I just don't feel like it. I get it, man. I get it. Honestly, look, honestly, I ain't supposed to say stuff like this. But if this wasn't my job and I didn't get a paycheck, there would be a lot of Sundays here probably across the last 15 years. You wouldn't have had a preacher preaching. I mean, I'm just being honest with you. There's just going to be times in life you're worn out, you're beat down. And yes, sometimes you need a break. I get it. Sometimes you need to breathe. Sometimes you need to take a rest. Sometimes as pastors, we're going to some of y'all going, stop serving. Stop. Breathe. Rest. Or people come to us burned out. That don't serve for a while. Just I get that. But that can't become the characteristic of your life. That can't become the habit. That's got to be the exception, not the rule. All right? You got to keep trusting and treasuring Jesus supremely. I, I, I know when I tell stories, I might embarrass. I'm not going to call a name on this one. Just this morning, a guy comes here to serve. We hugged in the hall, and he said, She's been seeing somebody else. I'm talking about his wife. And she's not coming back. He had more than a thousand reasons not to be here today. He had more than a thousand reasons not to show up and help you have a better experience by serving you today. But he's here serving in spite of everything breaking loose in his life. Because in spite of it all, one thing hasn't changed. Who God is, what he's done, and who he is in him. And it's out of that that he's serving because he's trusting and treasuring God supremely. Four, how do we continue to go and make disciples when everything at us says don't do it? We've got to trust and treasure God supremely. Let's go back to Saul. Ananias comes over, they connect. 
Holy Spirit fills up Paul. His name becomes Paul. And he starts traveling all over the world telling people about Jesus. And they applauded him and welcomed him and, you know, took him out to Ruth's Chris in every town he went to. Five-star hotel living, you know, cruising in the new car, you know, lots of TV programs. Preacher was living large, right? No, here's how Paul's life went down. 2 Corinthians chapter 11, verse 23, Paul said, Are they servants of Christ? I know I sound like a madman, but I've served him far more. I've worked harder, been put in prison more often, been whipped times without number, faced death again and again. Now, he had it made when he wasn't following Jesus in this life. All right, here's life with Jesus. Face death again and again. Five different times, and the Jewish leaders gave me 39 lashes. You can do the math. Three times I was beaten with rods. Once I was stoned. Three times I was shipwrecked. Once I spent a whole night and a day adrift at sea. I've traveled on many long journeys. I've faced danger from rivers, from robbers. I've faced danger from my own people, the Jews, as well as from the Gentiles. I've faced danger in the cities and the deserts and on the seas. And I've faced danger from men who claim to be believers but are not I've worked hard and long, and during many sleepless nights, I've been hungry and thirsty, and have often gone without food. I've shivered in the cold without enough clothing to keep me warm. Then besides all this, I have the daily burden of my concern for all the churches. You think Paul ever had a thought come to him and went, just quit, just shut up, just move on? You bet he did. A lot. But that's not his legacy, is it? By God's grace, he kept on. By God's grace, he continued to trust God supremely and to treasure him supremely. Now, you may be sitting here today, and I sure hope you are, and you're coming to the realization, you know what? My life cannot be described as a life that is worshiping God with all my heart, soul, mind, and strength. My life cannot be described as a life that is tenaciously connecting to God's people. My life cannot be described as a life that is tenaciously serving God's church. My life is not characterized as a life that is constantly going because I am concerned that other people don't have a relationship with Jesus. And the reason my life is not characterized by that is because I don't have a life where Jesus, where God is trusted and treasured supremely. But pastor, I want to change. I want to trust and treasure God supremely. What do I need to do? One word, repent. Let's go the other way. You say, can you help me out with that? What's that going to look like a little bit? As we close, I'll tell you a real quick story. In the Old Testament, you know, God had this thing called the Ark of the Covenant. And he told his people to build. It was like a mini throne where God would would abide. The presence of God was there. That's where he was with his people. And he gave them instructions how to handle that and take care of that. Well, they took his presence for granted. They began to marginalize God. They began to manipulate God. They go into battle against the Philistines, and the Philistines kick their tail. They get back to camp and go, hey, you know what we did wrong? We forgot our good luck charm. We didn't take the Ark of the Covenant in there with us. All right, let's do it again. So they go back into battle with the Philistines. They take the Ark of the Covenant, and the Philistines not only kick their tail a second time, this time they steal God. They take the Ark of the Covenant. The Philistines hang on to that for a little while, but God's stumping them on the head the whole time, and they realize their God is really mad at us because he's not supposed to be here. He's supposed to be with them, and so they put a little uh, we're sorry package together, and they ship God back to the Israelites. The only thing is when God gets back to the Israelites, nobody wants him, and he gets bounced around from place to place until finally he lands at the house of a man by the name of Obed-Edom. Obed-Edom opened up his house to God. He opened up his life to God. And for three months, God lived at the house with Obed-Edom. And here's what the Bible says, 2 Samuel chapter 6, verse 11. The ark of the Lord remained there in Obed-Edom's house for three months, and the Lord blessed Obed-Edom and his entire household. I believe that Obed-Edom teaches us a little bit about what it means to trust and treasure God supremely. Nobody else was trusting and treasuring God supremely. But Obed-Edom said, God, you're welcome here. And you sang those words, first song today. Holy Spirit, you are welcome here. Come fill this place with the atmosphere. Obed-Edom said the same thing. God, I know nobody else wants you, but I'm opening up my door. I'm opening up my house. I'm opening up my family. I'm opening up my heart because I trust and I treasure you supremely. You know what he had to do to trust and treasure God supremely like that? He probably had to rearrange some things. 
Some things in the house had to kind of get moved around. There ain't no room for Mama's china cabinet now because God's here. And there's no room for all these toys here. God's here. And Daddy's got his favorite chair over there. But if God's going to be in the middle of all this, we got to rearrange some things. Listen, if you're going to trust and treasure God, if you're going to turn today and repent and really begin to trust and treasure God, there's some things in your life that have got to get rearranged. Some priorities are going to have to get rearranged. Your calendar is going to have to get rearranged. Your schedule is going to have to get rearranged. The way you approach your life, the way you approach decision making, there are some significant things in your life that if God is going to be at the center of your life, if he's going to be at the center of your family, if he's going to be the center of your home, if he's going to be trusted and treasured supremely, there are some things in your life and mine that have got to get rearranged. Not only probably did Obed-Edom have to rearrange some things, there were probably some things that needed to be repaired. Miss Edom had probably been telling him for a while, look, one night the ladies are going to come over here and you have not fixed this yet, and that's got to be fixed, and when are you going to fix this? Well, now God's coming. And there were some things that were in disrepair, some things that were broken that had to be fixed. Listen, before you're truly trusting and treasuring God supremely, there's some things in your life that need repairing. There's some relationships in your life that need to be repaired. There's some people that you need to go forgive. There's some people that you need to offer forgiveness to. There's some I sorry, I'm sorry that you need to say to some other people. Not only did Obed Edom have to rearrange some things to trust and treasure God supremely, not only did he have to repair some things to trust and treasure God supremely, but when it really came down to it, there were some things that just had to be removed if he was going to trust and treasure God supremely. Some things that were in the house that just couldn't be there anymore. And there's some things in your life and in my life that if God's truly going to be trusted and treasured supremely, we've got to remove those things also. There's some habits that have got to be removed from our life. There's some decision making that's got to be removed the way we go about that. Some activities in our life that's got to be removed from our life if God's going to be trusted and treasured supremely. Things that are coming in the ear gate, things that are coming in the eye gate that have got to get removed from our lives if we're going to trust and treasure God supremely. Obed-Edom did whatever it took so that he and his family could trust and treasure God supremely. They rearranged and they repaired and they removed. Do you see what 2 Samuel 6.11 said? God blessed them. You know how he blessed them? Money, money, money. Right? No sickness, right? Popularity. Man, God blessed them. See, that's how a lot of you think about blessings. You think about stuff. That's not how, that's not how God blessed Obed-Edom and his family. God's not, that's, not, that's not what God's into. God's into providing the needs of his children, not the greeds of his children. All right? I'm doing my best. I fail miserably. I'm trying to trust and treasure God supremely. All right? The 2005 Chrysler Sebring with 213,000 miles did not make it to church today. The old bucket of bolts went a couple miles down the road and wouldn't get out of third gear and turned around and came back. And thank goodness I had a, another vehicle I could hop in and make it over here. God doesn't bless with stuff you can buy at a dealership. God doesn't bless with stuff you can buy at a big box store. You know how God blessed Obed-Edom? He blessed Obed-Edom with God, with his presence. That's what God wants to bless you with today and me with today because it's his presence that will fuel you to keep worshiping, to keep connecting, to keep serving. To keep going. But you will not know the blessing or the power of his presence as long as you go on living a life where he is not trusted and treasured supremely. But today, today, you draw the line in the sand and say, Jesus, today I'm repenting. I have trusted other things more than you. I've treasured other things more than you. Whatever needs to be rearranged, show me, I'll do it. Whatever needs to be repaired, show me, I'll do it. Whatever needs to be removed, show me, I'll do it. I just want to know when I walk out of this place today that you are in the middle of my life. And all I'm asking you is to bless me with more of you. That's what God's after, that we would trust him 
and treasure Him above all things and above all people. Next Sunday, we'll come to the Lord's table for the Lord's Supper. But we don't need to wait till next Sunday to start repenting. Next Sunday could be the most beautiful service we've ever had. This family is closely, more closely knitted together today than we were last time we had the Lord's Supper. The only thing that can mess it all up is that we don't start today getting ready for that. Paul said, you need to come to the table in a worthy manner. I think another way you could say that is come to the table trusting and treasuring God supremely. Let that begin today, right? Let that begin right now for the next seven days. Let's pray. God, we thank you for loving us when we don't love you. Thank you for being faithful to us when we're not faithful to you. Thank you that mercies are new every day. Thank you that there's no condemnation for those that you've adopted as your sons and your daughters. And Lord, forgive us for turning our hearts, affection, and minds attention to other things more than you. But Holy Spirit, I pray that today you're calling us to repentance, to turn from infatuation and hope in lesser things and to hope in God alone, that you would be supremely trusted here today. You would be supremely treasured here today. The only way that we're going to reflect you by worshiping, connecting, serving, and going in this world is by the power of your presence that is unleashed on our lives as day after day we rearrange life around you. We repair what is broken before you. We remove what is offensive to you. Like you did for Obed, Edom, and his house, you will bless us with more of you. And that will be the strength to lift our hands one more time, to extend our hands one more time, to bend our knee in service one more time, to open our mouth with the love of Jesus to somebody one more time. Your sweet presence with us. And Moses said, God, if you don't go with us, then we don't want to go. That's where I find myself today too, Lord. It ain't in me. I don't have it. But would you come and fill this place, this life, with yourself today? In Jesus' name. Let's stand. Let's repent. Let's repent. Let's obey the Lord. Let's respond to his word today. You'll leave today with him more at the center of your life or you will leave today with him further away. It's what you do with this decision that's before you right now. The decision you've got is, what am I going to do with what I've heard? Doing nothing does not result in nothing. It results in more separation and fellowship between you and God. What will you do with the word that the Lord has put before you? Precious cornerstone, sure foundation, you are faithful to the end. We are waiting on you, Jesus. We believe your Precious cornerstone, sure foundation, you are faithful to the end. We are waiting on you, Jesus. We believe your
Let the glory of your name be the passion of the church. Let the righteousness of God be a holy flame that burns. Let the saving love of Christ be the measure of our lives. We believe you're all to us. Only Son of God, sent from heaven, hope and mercy the cross you are everything you're the promise Jesus you are all to us let the glory of your name be the passion of the church let the righteousness of God be a holy flame that burns. Let the saving love of Christ be the measure of our lives. We believe you're all to us. Let the glory of your name be the passion of the church. Let the righteousness of God be a holy flame that burns. Let the saving love of Christ be the measure of our lives. We believe you're all to us. Lord, you're all to you're us. This, this is also what fuels us to keep on worshiping when it's hard, to keep on connecting when it's hard, to keep on serving when it's hard, to keep on going when it's hard. Because real soon, it's not going to be hard anymore. Amen. Let's worship. When this passing world is over, we will see you face to face and forever. Thank you for meeting with us today. Thank you for your word and thank you for your spirit. Thank you for drawing us to repentance and thank you for what you're doing in our church family. And we do pray that when we come to your table next Sunday, God, that it would be like no other day that we've experienced before. That, that we will have tangible evidence that you have been at work uniting a fellowship together this month expanding and deepening Christ-centered relationships. Lord, we look forward to reflecting and celebrating next week together. 
We thank you for all of this. In Jesus' good name we pray. All God's people said, amen. amen. Hey, great day today. Love you guys. If your Sunday school class is having lunch today in the fireside room, I'll see you there. The rest of you stay warm, all right?